Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Redeeming Grace Church. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Matt Rawlings, one of the pastors here. We're so glad that you're here with us. Um, we're grateful that you would join together to worship God. Uh, grateful to have friends back here as well and people visiting. If you're out in the lobby, go ahead and come on in. And if the ushers could go ahead and close those doors out there, uh, that would be great. We're grateful that we're joined together. If you could come in and find a seat, please. Um, we have a, a treat. Um, we have been going through a series on, if you can find a seat, please. If you're talking, go ahead and find a seat. That'd be a great way to honor um, the Lord right now. So um, we have been going through a series um, on fear, from faith, I mean, from fear to faith, and how to make the transition from fear to faith, and that we all struggle with fear. Every one of us struggles with fear to some degree, and we thought it'd be encouraging to you to hear from one of those who are a part of us, how God has helped meet them in the middle of this series to help them go from fear to faith. So, um, Erica Green, if you will share with us your testimony, thank you. So, I believe this is my first time sharing in front of a group, in front of church, so I'm trying not to be nervous. I keep telling myself, this isn't about me. This is about God. And so I'm so thankful for this opportunity to share with you all today. And um, I hope that what God has laid on my heart will bless each one of you. So many of you don't know me. My name is Erica Green and my brother, Seth Green, and his wife, Charity. They've been coming here for quite a while, and many of you know them. Um, they invited me and my four children to join them here at Redeeming Grace. And from the first Sunday I was here, I just felt so much love and grace and just felt right at home. And Sundays have become my favorite day of the week. Like, they can't come fast enough. Like, I want every day to be Sunday. <laughs> so I have four children, and I became a single mom nine years ago. Stepping out into the unknown with four children, I had many fears. Fears of how God would pro provide for us, how, he would, how I would be able to nurture and care for four children alone and meet all of their needs. But God has shown me every step of the way that he is faithful and that he will never leave me and my four children wanting any good thing. He is a good God always, and he has shown me that while I can never be enough for my children, that in his love, he is always enough. It's been a long journey of healing and faith and some really hard days. I had so many days when fear and worry would grip me when bills were due or when my children had needs, and I didn't see a way or when I didn't have answers for certain things that they were going through but each need no matter how big or small I saw God come through for me and he would provide above and beyond whatever I could ask or think and most of the time it was at the last second like the last day I think God likes to keep us on the edge of our seats and he loves surprises so God would always surprise me and and I would wonder, why did I ever fear or worry in the first place? Some days I found myself fighting really hard for my joy. That led me to start a thankful book four years ago. I started writing down daily gifts. Gifts of God coming through for me as he showed me his love and writing down all the ways that he showed me his love and how he was watching over me and my four children. Today, I have almost 2,000 entries in my thankful book of God's faithfulness to me and of his never-ending love. Going back and reading over my thankful book from time to time is a reminder to me of God's love and of his faithfulness. And not only has counting my daily gifts, being thankful for each one brought so much joy to my heart, it has helped me with my fear and worry. Just seeing God in the everyday things and how much he loves me. And listening recently to Pastor Matt's sermons on fear 
I think this is the first time I've ever heard a series on fear and how God's perfect love, when we fully grasp that, that it cast out all fear. And these recent sermons on fear have given me a better understanding of God's love for me, and it's increased my faith even more. I am learning that I don't ever have to fear or worry the future, that I don't ever have to fear all the unknowns that are out there, because God loves me and my children so much. I'm so thankful that God has set me free from worry and fear, and that he has given me a better understanding of his perfect love that never stops. One of my favorite songs is, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because He Lives, All Fear Is Gone. Because I Know He Holds the Future, Life Is Worth the Living Because He Lives. And when I think of this song, I think of God's hands being cupped and me and my four children sitting in the palm of his hand. And I don't know who needs to hear this right now, but all of us, all of God's children, were right there in his hands. God sees and he hears and he knows. And no matter what situation you are in, God has you and he's holding you in his hands and we don't have to fear the future because of his love, never-ending love for us. Thank you, Erica. Great job. You can't tell. It's the first time you've ever spoken publicly. You did a wonderful job. Thank you for sharing your heart about how God has ministered to you and set you free from fear. I think he has that for all of us. He desires to set us free from fear. Um, as we've been progressing along in this series on fear, uh, from fear to faith, um, we, we first really saw just who God is, that he is our shepherd. He is the shepherd, that we saw the care and compassion of God towards all those who are his sheep. And then we saw a couple weeks ago that... Um, in the midst of our fears, his love casts out all fear because he loves us perfectly. And then today, we're going to be looking at Psalm 46 to see how God as our refuge dispels all our fears. So let's turn to Psalm 46 and read God's holy inspired word together. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth's song, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. This is God's word. Let's pray. God, so often we, we become afraid. Lord, when, when the earth seems, the very earth seems to give way when everything around us is in upheaval, when the powers that be seem to be raging, when things seem out of control, we, we are tempted to fear and to look to all kinds of places for safety and security. 
God, thank you for this, this word, this imagery of you who is our refuge. You are our refuge. Father, I pray that you would help us see where we turn aside to other places and other things and people for refuge. God, I pray that you would calm our fears as we see that you are our refuge. May we go from a place of, of fear to a place of faith in you. Security, comfort, rest in you. God, give us all grace to hear today by your Holy Spirit. Open up our ears and our minds that we might behold you and see you, hear you, Lord. And God, give me grace to preach. Would you fill me with your spirit so that your words are spoken today? We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, I remember when I first read a book. Um, it was by a guy named Sebastian Young, and, and it, was, it was called The Perfect Storm. I think I have got a picture of, I think, of that storm that you see in, there's a movie that was adapted from that, and in, in this perfect storm situation, it was a, a depiction of what really happened, or at least what they think really happened, because the ship was lost, but there was this kind of culmination of events. There had been a storm. Uh, the storm had progressed up the coast, up to um, the far northern reaches of the U.S., and off the coast of New England and Newfoundland, where, where these ships would go, and they would fish off that coast all of a sudden and this perfect storm developed where there's this unnamed hurricane that they didn't even know about it, it came about and it was caused 100 foot rogue waves now I don't know if you've ever been in a big sea before or not but it's a little frightening the, the biggest thing I've ever personally been in I was in a kayak once in the Outer Banks and there had been a storm and I was kayaking out after the storm it was all gone I wasn't being foolish and I was going out through the waves they say okay go when a wave comes up you go right through it and it'll be fine this is a sea kayak it was probably 10 or 12 feet long and I was kayaking out and as I was going out I was like this wave looked unusually big and I thought that's strange because all the other waves have been a couple feet you know three feet four feet five feet and then this one looks bigger than normal. And I was going up the wave, like they say, and I kept going up and up and up, and the whole kayak flipped over backwards. And I realized this was like a 10-foot wave. I just went up. It's a rogue wave out of the blue. For me, that was overwhelming. That was scary for me. That was, that was bigger than what I was used to. I couldn't imagine a 100-foot wave, the, the oceans, the waters raging and roaring. And that's really the, the imagery that we're meant to have is that life sometimes is like that. The waters are raging and sometimes in your life there will be times when you have troubles and sometimes there's going to be those times when there are a perfect storm. And I say perfect in Corinthians because there's nothing perfect about storms in your life. You're not like, oh, this is perfect, unless it's sarcastic. And there'll be times in your life when these storms rage and, and troubles hit you. And, and the question is, when those things happen, where will you go? What will you do? We're, we're meant to see that in the midst of that kind of raging troubles, raging storms, there is a place, there is a person, there is one we can go to who is meant to be our refuge. That's unquestionable. And so we, we, have this, we have this imagery here of God being our refuge, but the, the question is, will he be? Is he our refuge? Is he your refuge? He says, he is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. There's no doubt about it. Trouble exists, right? Right? If, if, you, if you've been alive for very long, you know that trouble exists. There's, there's no such thing as a trouble-free life. There's no such thing as life without troubles. And the word that's used here for trouble in the Bible, it, it can be used either for affliction or distress or anguish. And I know that all of us at times have known all of those different kinds of troubles, affliction, distress, anguish. Anybody here ever known any trouble before? You can put your hand up. It's okay. Anybody currently knowing some trouble in your life? Good. that's a troubled child we'll help them <laughs> even as kids we have trouble and we get in trouble right when I was a kid I got in a lot of trouble um, there was often all kinds of trouble the Bible doesn't pretend that's what I love about God's word that's what I love about the Bible that's what I love about God is that the Bible doesn't try to pretend Christianity. We don't try to pretend like life is all hunky-dory, everything's happy, you know, and, and everything's fine, and everything's good. 
You know, we don't pretend to sing the, the song in the Lego movie, everything is awesome. No, it's not. There are troubles, and many of us are troubled now. If you live long enough, you're going to experience trouble. And in fact, Jesus said in, in John 16, 33, he says that in this world you will have troubles. You will have troubles. It's not a question if, it's just a question of when. Many are troubled by daily challenges, by hardships, by inabilities. The thing that frustrates me the most probably is my own limitations, my own weaknesses, my own failures. Many of us will be troubled by illness when there is a pernicious disease or illness that you are battling and it won't go away. A lot of us are troubled by weakness. Some face the distress or of rejection, loneliness. Some experience physical trouble. Some are troubled here by addiction. Some have financial trouble. Some have relational trouble. Some people experience the anguish of loss from the death of a loved one. And the fact that all of us will one day face death is troubling. Anybody tells you that believing in Jesus will remove all your troubles, they're not being honest and it's not truthful. At times, you might even have more troubles if you believe in God and his word. The question is not if we'll be in trouble, but will we turn to God in our trouble? Where do you turn in trouble? Where are you most tempted to turn when you get into trouble? The question is, will we fear when we're faced with trouble, or will we have the peace that is found only by taking refuge in God? A lot of us can become fearful. Our fear can drive us, and we heard over the last few weeks, our fear can drive us to try to cling to things, to try to hang on to things, to grasp on to things, to hold them tightly. Sometimes we try to hold on to people. We fight against those we think that are the cause of our troubles. Sometimes we deceive to try to get out of trouble. When I was a kid, I, I, I became a master of deception. I thought it would get me out of trouble. It often got me into worse trouble. Sometimes we respond in self-sufficiency. We try to pull ourselves up. Sometimes we try to hide. We try to distract ourselves, pretend they don't exist, to drown our troubles with entertainment and all forms of addiction. The question is, how will you respond? How do you respond when you face trouble? Where will you go when the storms of life rage? Who do you go to? Where do you seek refuge? Do you seek refuge in someone or something or some methodology or something that's flawed that's eventually going to fail? Or where do, you, where do you seek strength? If you seek strength in yourself, then one day you will fail too. If you seek your strength in other people, refuge in other people, one day they will fail. If you seek your strength and refuge in, in things, possessions, whatever, refu reputation, all that will fail. And what we need to hear, what we need to get from this passage, it's, it's really clear and it's really straightforward. It's really simple. And it's really the big idea that no matter the trouble, because God is our refuge, we will not fear. No matter the trouble, because God is our refuge, we will not fear. The question is, is God your refuge? If so, if he becomes your refuge, then you will not fear seems almost too good to be true, right? But there is a reality here of because God is our refuge, we will not fear. This doesn't mean the fearful things won't happen to you, but in the face of fears, we won't give in to those things if God is our refuge. Often we fear it's really just evidence of the fact that we are not finding our refuge and strength in God. That we're turning somewhere else, that we think that our ability is our place of refuge. So we fear when we're not able to do something. So, oh no, everything's falling apart because I'm not able to do this thing or I'm not able to overcome my weakness. Or I'm not able to overcome my sin, my failures. Or we think that someone else is our place of refuge, but when they reject us or turn us away, we, we begin to fear. It reveals where our source of refuge is. And, and God, he wants to be our refuge, not because he's egocentric, but because he alone is a reliable refuge. He alone is a place where we can find refuge and hope and strength and help. He wants to be our refuge. He wants to be our fortress because it's the safest place for us. He made us to be in relationship with him, and it's the safest, most secure place we can ever be is, is finding refuge in him. 
And, and what, what, one of the first things that we see in this passage is that in our troubles, in our troubles, we take refuge in God. Why? Because he's not moved. Because he's not moved. Now, I don't mean that he's not emotionally moved by our troubles. He is unshaken. He is stable. He is, as this scripture says, our fortress. And that brings to mind a lot of things. Now, for us today, we're not really familiar with the idea of a place of refuge or a fortress. Most of us have never had to take shelter. I was looking up some different types of shelters and thinking through in World War II when, when the Nazis were bombing Great Britain and going over London. They, they really were aware that they had to take shelter. They had all kinds of different types of shelters. I think I have some pictures up there. The first one is this place called a, the, the Anderson Shelters they, they provided. It was this little corrugated structure and they would take this, you can go to the next one, and they are buried in their backyards. You can go to the next picture over there, perfect. Um, they buried in their backyards and, and these shelters, they would go underground and they would plant gardens on top and they would find refuge in these shelters. And I don't think it's working, but that's okay. Um, and, and they had to, when, when they would hear the air raid sirens go off, if they had a backyard, they would go down into this place and they would find shelter. When bombs crashed around them, when things happened, they would find rest, they would find refuge. That was their little fortress. The problem is it didn't really, didn't really work uh, because it only fits six people in a cramped condition. And so um, not every house had that. And so they thought, well, you know what we'll do is we'll, we'll provide another place. And so another way to have shelter. And they were grappling with these things. And so they created this little steel structure, like a little cage that you could build. <laughs> it was called a Morrison sh shelter. And you would put these little cages in your house. Now, not about you, but I, I don't know if I'd like to, to sleep in that cage, the whole house falling down all around you. And yeah, you're in the cage, but now, now you might be trapped and can't get out. So they realized that was problematic. The cage worked. Most, you know, when houses fell down, that, that kept people safe. Problem is now you've got thousands of pounds of debris on top of this little structure that you're sleeping in and you're stuck. That's not a good place of refuge. And so they thought, well, maybe other places of refuge. And so they opened up the London Underground, the tubes, to people. And so um, before they did this, actually, this was the first one of the pictures when they said, no, you're not, we're not going to allow anybody in the underground shelters because it's too dangerous. And people were like, forget it. We're not sleeping in those little cages. Those backyard things don't work so well either. And so they flooded the underground in London. And so they finally realized, we, we need a place of shelter, a safe place for people to go when the bombs fall. And so then they outfitted the, the, the tube, they, they shut different portions down, and they took shelter there. When we read of this, this imagery in, in Psalms, it says, God is our refuge. We're meant to have that in mind. No matter what happens around us, no matter what falls, no matter what troubles come, he is our, our place of safety and refuge, our place of strength, our place of help, he is our fortress. There's, there's two different words to use there. It says, he, he is our refuge. Not he's our refuge, he's our fortress. He's a strong place for us to go. When the storms of life roar, when the nations rage. We might not have physical threats we need to take shelter from in this country. Most often we do not. In other places in the world, they do. We, we might not have physical places to take shelter, but... We, we, I mean, in physical times when, when we have threats around us, but we're prone to fear. In the midst of all our different fears, God wants us to know something very important. He's our refuge. He is our, our fortress. He's the place we're meant to run to. He's our stronghold. But will you run to other strongholds that fail, that trap you, that collapse? All through the Bible, there's this idea. It's really prevalent in the book of Psalms, especially this, this idea that keeps getting repeated over 75 different places in the book of Psalm, which is really not a very long book. Over 75 different places where God continually repeats and reiterates in so many different Psalms this idea, these, these, these uh, words that are all synonyms of each other, really. This, he, he is a refuge, he's a fortress, he's a stronghold, he's a rock, he's a shelter. Go ahead and look up in your, in your concordance, if you will, at some point and say, okay, hey, you know what? You, you talked about that. Let me look up all the places where you talked about being a stronghold or a fortress or a rock or a shelter. 
why does God talk about that so much in the book of Psalm and all throughout the Bible? Why does, why does he talk about himself that way of hiding his children under his wings? And so many different metaphors used for this idea. It's because we need it. Because we're prone, we need constant reminders. We're prone to look to other places for shelter. Where are you prone to look for shelter? Where are you prone to run to? Some can look for financial stability, for their safety, try to take refuge in money, in job. Some look for refuge in power. Some look for refuge in possessions, refuge in people, self-worth. Where, where do you look for refuge? Where do you look for strength? Where do you run? Where are you tempted to turn to other than God? What we all need to see is we can take refuge in God. He's the only one who is completely and totally reliable. He's safe. He's strong. There's nothing that can happen to us that takes us away from him or out of him. And, and, and I love, look down at your Bible in verse 2. It says, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at a swelling, there's this imagery, no matter what happens, whether it's the physical world or not, or whether it's metaphorical, whatever happens around, all kinds of different troubles, though the earth gives way, though the ground under your feet seems completely unstable, if you've ever, anybody here ever gone through a, an earthquake before? Anybody ever had to ride out an earthquake or experienced an earthquake? It, it is a disconcerting thing when the ground beneath you, which you're used to being stable, when it starts to move. Because if the ground's moving underneath of you, then where do you go? What's stable? If you never experience it, it's disconcerting, to say the least. It's disorienting. And, and for a moment, when you first experience it, you you're, you can't really understand what's going on. You're confused. And then after you realize what's happening, one of the first things that happens to you, one of the first things that you think of is, oh no, where do I go to be safe? Where, where, where do I go? Where can I be safe? And then somewhere around that time, I don't know, before or after, depends on who you are, you think, oh no, what about the people I love? Where will they go to be safe? Where will they find shelter? God's saying, when everything in your life becomes unstable when things in your life when the very foundations you've built your life on seem to be shaken when they are shaken whether physically or metaphorically he is our refuge and then he doesn't just stop there look down at verse 6 he says though the nations rage so he's not just talking about physical troubles in the natural world and, and metaphorically about how things are unstable, but also there is a real trouble. Nations rage around us. We, we have lived in a long season of relative peace in this country. Most were not old enough to remember the horrors of World War II. A lot of us remember either Vietnam or the aftermath of Vietnam. The nations rage. They continue to rage. No matter how the nations rage around us, in all the parts of the world, there at some point in time, there the nations are raging. Our nation seems to be internal, internally raging at times. It says the kingdoms totter. There's dominions, there's a rule and a reign tottering. Things seem unstable right now. Maybe, maybe you're of one camp or another, and, and maybe the politics of the day, no matter what party you find yourself, no matter where you find yourself, maybe, maybe you think, oh my goodness, what's happening? The nation's raging. The kingdoms are tottering. And yet, we have this picture of the immovable God, the one who's over all, the one who's sovereign over all things. The one who, who speaks and things happen. Look at the last part of verse 6. says, he utters, all the nations are raging. The earth is trembling. Everything's going wrong. Everything's failing around us. Everything's in turmoil. And yet he utters his voice and the earth melts. God just speaks and the earth melts away. Everything melts away at God's word. It's a picture of his ultimate dominion and reign. He is our refuge because he is sovereign. He is unmoved. And then look in verse 8, the psalmist writes, Come, behold the works of the Lord. I love that Erica shared about how she keeps a, 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 a journal of all the ways that God's been good to her. She keeps a, a Thanksgiving journal. And 
in what we're meant to do. And look in verse 8. It says, Behold the works of the Lord. Look and see how God has been faithful. Look and see how God does works. Look and see what God does. He is sovereign over all things. And it gives some examples. He's, he's brought desolations on the earth. The earth is no threat to God, nor anyone in it. He makes wars cease. There's no power, no kingdom that is greater than God. There's You don't have to worry or fear when there's any political instability. You don't have to worry or fear who's in power because you know why? God is. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He's the bringer of peace, not any politician. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. What is that meant to show us? That no matter how strong people seem, all the weapons of of man, all all the ways that people have of fighting, they are powerless before God. He's unmoved. He is sovereign. It's not by our might or our power that we are delivered. The nations would tend to look to make alliances with other nations because they were unable, so they'd look to another nation. And God's like, I, no, don't do that. He says, he says I, I'm the one who, who brings wars to an end. I break the bow. I break the spear. I burn the chariots with fire. You don't, have to be, you don't have to be afraid of any of the nations around you and try to make alliances. Just like in our life, we don't have to be afraid of all that goes around, try to make alliances, trying to, trying to find refuge in other places. He says, no. And look at verse 10. This is a verse that I think we, we wrongly, although it's how we believe it, it is true, and this place is not what it's saying. He says, be still and know that I'm God. What's the context here? It's in looking to kingdoms, looking to the raging, looking to the wars, looking for you know, how, how the nations are powerful, and it's saying, no, stop it. Stop looking around. I'm the one who makes all these things cease. I'm the one who makes wars end. I'm the one who breaks the power of man. So be still. Stop looking to your own strength. Stop looking to strength around you. Stop fretting and worrying. Be still. Stop it. And know that I'm God. Know that I am God. You are not. Nothing else is. No other nation is. No person is. I am God. Be still. Stop it. Know that I'm God. I will be, how do we know it says that? Well, look, look in the last side of the verse. I will be exalted among the nations. There is nothing else that will be exalted. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still. Stop it. Know that I'm God. Know that I will be exalted. Don't worry about anyone or anything else being exalted, any other power. I will be exalted. I'm more powerful than all those things. Be still and know that. in the middle of roaring and raging waters, and I, I love, love that he talks about the, the nations raging, the waters roaring. It's the same word, just used in different ways. The nations raging, the waters are roaring. But yet we're to be still by know, knowing that he's God. We're to have peace knowing that he's God, that he's the one who will be exalted. In the middle of raging, roaring waters, his river is peaceful and makes glad. Like the second truth that we see in trouble, we take refuge in God who is able and who does supply our needs. Look in verse 4 and 5. In the middle of this raging, so we have here in, in verses 2 and 3, we have the earth giving way, the mountains falling into the sea, the waters roaring and foaming. And then skip down to verse 6, we see the nations raging. And we have then in the middle of these two things, we have in the middle, sandwiched between roaring, raging, what do you see in, in verses 4 and 5? You see a picture of absolute calm. A picture of absolute calm. In the middle of the storm, in the middle of raging, in the middle of roaring, what you see is absolute calm. I love the picture that we see here. It's no matter what happens, no matter how the natural world might be seem to be falling apart, no matter how the kingdom of earth may rage, what, what seems to rage all around us, beautiful imagery in this in this chaos and upheaval swirling all around there is where God dwells and there is peace there are you running to him in refuge where he dwells there's a calm place the place where God lives look in verse 4 it says there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God now, what in the world does that mean? Well, in ancient cities, when, when armies would, would come against the city, when, when they would try to take over the city and they couldn't, and yet, so they would have a siege, they would basically wait until they just died of thirst. And this is saying, no, there, 
God has a place where no nation can make them thirsty. He says, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. There is a river, and it's that beautiful imagery we saw in Revelation as well. It's this, this river that flows from the very throne of God and the Lamb, this river whose source is God. It's unquenchable, it's unstoppable. And all throughout the city of God, wherever God dwells, wherever he lives, his streams of water, of living water, make us glad. It can't be cut off if there's an underground stream or aquifer in a city that was the place you wanted to go when when armies surrounded you. And he's saying, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. It's a never-ending river. In his presence where there's fullness of joy. We have the river of life where God dwells and where we live with him. It's the same river of life that's spoken about in the end of Revelation where God's holy city all are, has their thirst quenched the river that waters the tree of everlasting life where God's people eat and taste the goodness forever. Are you there? Are, are you drinking from his streams of living water? Are you finding refreshment in him? That's where we're meant to find refuge and strength. He's our fortress, but he's our fortress where he refreshes us. He's our place of refreshment. He's unmoved. He's sovereign. He's over all things. And he gives us his water of life as we drink deeply made clean by his water. He quenches our thirst. He's our hope, our strength, no matter what happens. If you understand that, you begin to move from a place of fear to a place of faith. Not only can we take refuge in God who's not moved, he's able to supply all of our needs. The third truth that we see here is that in trouble we take refuge in God who is with us. Sometimes we feel alone, don't we? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I hated being alone. I had issues being alone. Now, sometimes it's okay, but not for long periods of time. But sometimes when we are alone, we feel like there's no help in trouble. We can't see God. We sometimes turn to things we can see. And so God tells us something three different ways, three different times in this passage, three different places. Look in verse 1, look in verse 7, look in verse 11. There's, there's three times repetition. When the Bible talks about three times repetition, you, you, you need to pay attention. That's, that's probably what we're meant to see. Look in verse 1. It tells us something very important in verse 1. God's our refuge and strength. Look in verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And then in verse 11, word for word, repeated again, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Three times. What are we meant to see through those three things? Not only is he our fortress, not only will he not be moved, is he our supply in the midst of this fortress. We have refreshment and we have satisfaction and fulfillment and we have a place of safety. But in the middle of all that, we need to see he's not just a fortress, he's with us. When you feel all alone, he is God. We're meant to remember who he is and who we are. And then see something, he's our refuge and strength. He's not someone else's refuge and strength. He's our, God's children. If you have placed your trust, your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, if you've come to him, repented, believed, you too can say he is our refuge. Even when you feel alone, when nations rage, when waters roar, you can say God is our, God is my refuge. It's personal, he's not distant. He's not somebody else's God. He's our God. We belong to him. He's not distant. He's not sitting on the sidelines watching and passively letting things happen. He's not, he's not disinterested. Sometimes I think we feel that way. He is our... I love how it puts it. He is our very present. Look in verse 1. Our very present. What are we meant to get? He's He's present. He's our very present help. 
when I was a young boy somewhere from about age 4 to age 14 I was I was inseparable from my best friend we were together where however and whenever we could be after school almost every day we'd be together too until either I ate dinner there or he came over to our house or it didn't matter what we're doing it it could have been just watching Scooby-Doo or playing war climbing in a tree house exploring we were always together if we could be we played together we thought we'd always be together couldn't imagine that life would ever have have us go apart we saw somewhere in some movie i don't know what movie we saw the idea of being blood brothers we both sliced our hands and we we became blood brothers mingled our blood with each other i'm not endorsing that by the way kids don't go and do that Um, i absolve myself parents if that happens we were inseparable until my family moved to another town and we both just kind of drifted apart. And there was nothing intentional, nothing deliberate. Um, no matter how good a friend is, it's a rare friend who is ever present. Even lifelong friends may not be ever present. Even a spouse may not be ever present. A sibling or parent can't be ever present. But God is our very present or ever present help. Do you know that? If you are in trouble, if you have troubles and the world is raging around you, here's how you can have stability and strength and peace and find God as your refuge. If you remember that if you place your faith in him, he not only is for you, but he has given you his spirit. And now he said he is ever present with you. And what is the Holy Spirit called? The helper, the comforter. He is our ever present help. If you're God's child, if you've been adopted by him and made not only his child but his friend, he is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Day or night, waking or sleeping, no matter where we go, what we do, no matter what trouble we find ourselves in or that we get ourselves into, by the way, the Lord of hosts, look in verse 7, is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He's meant to be personally for you because he is personally for you. He's meant for you to see that. And, and who is this who is with us? He tells us who he is. Now he's just God, this, the creator of all things, but he's also the Lord. And we saw a couple of weeks ago that, that 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 word, the Lord, when it's all in caps, it, it refers to God's covenant name, Yahweh. He is a covenant-keeping God. And not only is he the Lord, he's Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, but he's the Lord of hosts. Now, for us today, we're like, what does of hosts mean? Well, he's the, he's the Lord of every army. He is the one who's over every power. He is the, the Lord of the heavenly hosts. He's the Lord of the earthly hosts. He is, he is God, Yahweh, the covenant keeping God, who's over all things. He's almighty, as the NIV puts it. I, I loved it when my two oldest children, when they were young, when they were very little, I would hold my arms down, and they would latch on, and then I would stand up, and I would pick them up, and I felt like I was just, you know, all powerful. But they thought so too. And they were hanging on and they would laugh. And, and they were like, whoa, dad, you're so strong. And I'm like, yeah. And um, <coughs> I can't do that anymore. Um, Noah is too big and Abby is too big for me to do that. But they'd hang on my arms and they thought that I was invincible. That kind of strength that seemed so beyond them and I loved that they were impressed with my might but you know I'm not that mighty in comparison no matter how strong you are no matter how powerful you are God is the almighty he's the Lord of hosts no matter how powerful anybody else seems he's able to lift us up from our troubles sustain us and be our strength in trouble not just when we hang on to him because he hangs on to us That's the difference in that picture. It's not that we're hanging on to God and he's picking us up out of the troubles. No, he's holding on to us and we're secure. His grip doesn't fail. He's a covenant-keeping, faithful God, no matter how unfaithful his people are, because that's the time when we need him the most to hold us. It doesn't depend on us. His faithfulness doesn't depend on our faithfulness. It depends on his character and nature. But not only that, he's the God of Jacob. What does that mean? Who is Jacob? Do you remember the story of Jacob in the Bible? Jacob, his name actually means deceiver, supplanter. 
The psalmist intentionally doesn't say he's the God of Israel here because Jacob was later renamed Israel because God redeemed him and, and so it's symbolic of, of God redeeming who Jacob is at his nature as a deceiver to Israel. But he doesn't use Israel. He says he's God of Jacob. He's the God of deceivers. He's, he's not, it's not that he's endorsing Jacob being a deceiver, but he's the God who rescues even deceivers. People who try to take matters into their own hands like Jacob. God is the God of Jacob. God chose Jacob. What do we know about him? You have Jacob, you have Esau. You know, Jacob got in a lot of trouble with his brother. <laughs> tried to deceive, tried to take his own place, tried to, to find his place of safety and security in his birthright. You know, that caused problems for him. He had to run away. He was not a safe place. His place of refuge was not safe. And yet we, we read in Romans, it says, God chose Jacob, not because of anything he'd done, either good or bad. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of, he, who chooses us, not because we've done good or bad things, but because our hope, our trust is in him. He didn't leave Jacob. He's not going to reject any who come to faith in him. If you have put however meager your faith is, your faith, your trust in God, if you've repented, believed in him, he will be your God. He's the God of Jacob. He's with us. He's our place of refuge. What does Jesus tell us in John 6, 37? He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And listen to this. Whoever, if you're here, you're a whoever. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. He'll be no means turn away. He is with us. He is our fortress. Do you know what Jesus was called in, in Matthew, the very beginning of Matthew? He says he's, he was Emmanuel. What does that mean? He means God with us. Children of Israel wondered, would God really be with them when they went into exile? Now, Jesus is the complete and utter fulfillment of God with us. And he says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's he saying? I'm your place of refuge. I'm your fortress. I'm your place of rest. I'm your place of strength. Stop it. Be still. Stop trying to work on your own. If you're, you're carrying all these burdens, stop it. Be still and know that I'm God. And it says in Hebrews 13, he says, For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? He'll never leave you or forsake you. Nothing will separate us from his love. Therefore, what's the conclusion? Therefore, we will not fear. There's nobody greater. There's no one who keeps covenant like him, no one who's almighty, no one else who chooses to love us like he does, no one else who loved us so much that he sent his son to come and take our place, to live the life we couldn't live, to, to die in our place, to conquer death so his spirit might be with us forever. There's no one else like that. He alone is our refuge. And because he's our refuge, when he's our refuge, Therefore, we will not fear. The question is not whether God can be our refuge and strength, but whether we will turn to him as a refuge and strength and be reminded of who he is. Will you rest in Jesus and his finished work on your behalf? When the accuser, the enemy, when he rains down his bombs of accusations, will you find shelter in what Jesus has done to take your blows, to take the punishment you deserve? Well, when others hate you, what will you shelter in? When illness comes, what will you shelter from? When you're weak, will you look in for strength? No matter the trouble, because God's our refuge, we will not fear. If you get that, you too will say, God's our refuge and strength, therefore we will not fear. Amen? Joe, I don't know if you have something ready or not, but if you can come on up and uh, get the band ready to... Them to close us as well. It was good to reflect on God's goodness and who He is. As they're making their way up, let's, let's pray and ask God to help us. Father, we need to be reminded. Lord, thank you for bringing to mind all the places we are tempted to look for refuge and strength. And would you enable us to turn away from those false places of refuge? 
and turn to you, God. If there are people here who have not placed their faith in you, I pray, pray that you would enable them to place their trust, their hope, and their faith in you to find you as the refuge. Lord, for those who have placed their faith in you, Lord, I pray that we would find our refuge in you, that we would seek our refuge in you, that you would give us peace, that your river would make glad our hearts. I pray that we would dwell in your presence, God, that we would come daily to your presence to find mercy and grace. Lord, thank you that, Jesus, you made a way that we can come before your very throne, the throne of God Almighty, the Lord of hosts, to find mercy and grace in our time of need. God, may we, may we do that. May we be refreshed, Lord. And would you dispel all of our fears as we take refuge in you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Hello, I'm Matt Rawlings. And I'm Aaron Campbell. We're pastors of Redeeming Grace Church. Thanks for taking a few moments to hear a little bit more about who we are as a church. What we are most passionate about is the good news of Jesus Christ that the Bible calls the gospel. In fact, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to anyone who believes. And it changes everything. It changes not only who we are, how we relate to God, but how we relate to the world around us. Because the central message of all of Scripture is God's loving rescue mission of a people for himself, we want that to be central to our life as a local church. That's why our vision is to be gospel-centered in community, in worship, and in mission. As those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, God gives us an entirely new identity. And that identity changes everything about us, not only who we are and what we live for, but in how we live. In fact, God continues to make us more and more like Jesus Christ as we are loving Him with all that we are. This good work that Jesus is doing is so exciting that we want to tell everyone about what He's done. And we want everyone to experience this life-transforming power. That's why our mission as a church is to be disciples of Jesus Christ, who grow and make disciples. As disciples of Jesus Christ, God not only calls us to Himself, but He calls us to be a part of a local church body where we can worship God, receive mutual encouragement and fellowship together. Join us this Sunday, 10 a.m., just south of Woodard Road on Highway 14.